Hey everyone, this is Dr. Sebastian Gonzalez from the Performance Place. Today we are going over shoulder conditions. Uh, this is a presentation we've taken through CrossFit gyms mainly, uh, and we're mainly going to be talking about warm ups, types of warm ups, mobility warm ups, uh, uh, stability warm ups, and how to pick which ones are best for your specific condition. The, uh, the best way to get through this and actually navigate it is going to be if you already knew what your specific injury of the shoulder is then you can pick which one or which type of warm-up is best for you. Uh, what I've noticed, at least with um, is it general, trend, general trends, it seems that a lot of people are migrating towards doing um, mobility for everything. It seems like they want to mobilize soft tissues, mobilize joints, they want to do everything. Um, when the fact of the matter is, sometimes you need to make sure it sticks better. Sometimes you, need, you have an unstable area, an unstable shoulder, um, that might not respond best to mobilizing. So that is the thought process of today. Uh, I don't want to put down um, any one type of uh, warm-up, but for the most part, if you know what you have, you can pick your warm-up accordingly. There is not a cookie-cutter thing for each and every person out there. So take it as that um, is intended to be a good thing. We're not putting down mobility. So mobility warm-ups, the typical ones that I see is dislocates and around the worlds. That's something you can YouTube. Um, and there are other ones with bands and uh, things of that nature, which I have seen, which actually I like. Um, they're working on the scapulothoracic joint. Um, I do like dislocates around the world, but at the same time, if you have a, a loose shoulder, it's not going to help you out at all. So there are a lot of uh, articles and ideas out there on things such as mobility versus stability. Um, it's been a hot topic for a while. But at the same time, uh, I'm going to make it very simple and say anything can be fixed with WD-40 or duct tape. And I think probably people that grew up with MacGyver can see that you put things together with sometimes uh, chewing gum if you need to. Uh, you're not going to use um, you're not going to use something to loosen things when you need to make sure it sticks. So if something's too loose, you tighten it. If something's too tight, you loosen it. Um, and then again, if you know what shoulder condition you have, you can make that judgment call from there. Now. We'll start with this. This is our reference list. Uh, I try not to put anything out there that is um, has it, that doesn't have research backing it. And these are three exercises that have these specific research research articles behind it. Uh, I thought they were very good to read, and I strongly suggest people that are watching this or listening to this to make sure that you double check my work too. There's no point taking my word um, as gold. You should make sure that you're making your own. Um, judgment calls based upon the research. So these are the three things we found. These are the uh, only uh, platforms for uh, progression. Keep that in mind. We didn't want to overwhelm people walking into this gym saying here's 20 different exercises you can do for the shoulder. Go. So we did three. The first one, uh, overhead shoulder shrugs. So actually labeled it a little wrong. Um, it is used mainly for scapulothoracic uh, function, and it's going to mainly it's going to be mainly used for the inferior and middle trap. The external rotators, or sorry, the uh, external rotation is a very standard one use. It's a sideline external rotation. Uh, I use personally I use about a five pound weight. It works the infraspinatus, which is one of the rotator cuff muscles, and the supraspinatus at about 45 degrees when you're laying on your side. Um, the muscle itself usually works in, a, in, in and around, I believe it's 15, 30 degrees-ish, nothing really beyond that. So if you're going beyond 45 degrees, uh, you're really just doing a little bit more work than you need to. It's not as specific. So again, you can call me out on those numbers. Uh, roughly, I just say it starts movement. Um, the arbitrary degrees doesn't, ra doesn't really matter too much to me. Um, now when we get into um, loads with it, I personally do this um, cycle about two times. I usually tell people don't focus on how much sweat you're going to get. It's not going to be a workout to warm up. And you probably want to do something like a general warm up even before this. You get your blood moving for about 10 minutes. So I usually have people do the overhead shrugs with about 15 to 45 pounds I mislabeled here. External rotation I use about 5 pounds and sideline to about 45, I do about 5 pounds. Women will use a little less than that. Again, you just want to feel a little bit of a burn if you have pain with it or restricted movement. Don't go through it. There's no point in flaring things up if, if you don't know what you have in general already. So uh, again, there's lots of progressions to these. These are just the ones that we found uh, these research articles on. And I'll leave it right here for a second so you guys can just take a look at it. 
Now, um, when I present, usually I try to make a lot of visuals. You'll notice in this particular presentation, there's not. And the reason is because you want to make sure you don't have copyrighted images on your stuff or they'll come back and bite you. So, any image on here is actually my image. And the one that I had for a lowrider, it was uh, right here. So, why don't I just paint a picture for you. And if you close your eyes and imagine one of those sweet lowriders with a back wheel is almost covered completely by the wheel well and it's almost dropped completely on the ground. It's a nice rim, a nice tire. Um, very pretty. So imagine one of those and you take the wheel and you, there's five bolts in it, maybe four. So you unbolt more than half of them, you take the bolt out and the other ones you loosen and you just let's drive this thing real fast down the highway and just see what sticks. And you'll notice that the wheel is going to start wobbling around. It's going to shake around the well, it's going to tear the well up, it's going to mess up the tire. It's going to bend the rim. There's going to be lots of problems that come from this. Um, and that analogy is basically of the shoulder. If you have one that is a chronic dislocator or an instability, you're going to have a lot of rotator cuff muscles or cartilage around it, which is going to shred up and it's going to go into spasm. Now, is the main problem the actual cuff or is it the instability? Personally, I think it's the instability, and if we're talking about this wheel analogy, the problem is the wheel doesn't have any bolts on it, so it's just wiggling around. So, if the wheel worked out perfect, you wouldn't have the well all shred up. And actually, I found a really cool image, um, which I couldn't provide, obviously, of if you look up tire blowouts um, damage uh, onto Google, oh man, you see all these wheel wells just shredded up. It was a great second picture to that uh, wobbly wheel or low rider. Um, but anyways, the idea is you got to make sure that if it's unstable, you bolt it on. And this is why we pick those exercises, because a lot of people doing these general warm-ups focus on mobility, and sometimes you need to, to bolt that tire back on. Now, these are the three major shoulder conditions that we see um, with CrossFit, and actually a lot of sports in general. And I won't spend too much time on a six scapula, because it's more of a precursor for the other two. Um, and you can probably spend an entire uh, 15 minutes on six scapula. And it's a very subjective um, type of diagnosis, I, I believe, and I'll show you why. So six, six scapula mainly means scapular malposition, inferior me medial border prominence, coracoid pain, and malposition, and dyskinesis of scapular motion. Let's just generalize it as saying the scapula is not working well and it hurts certain places. Okay? And this is me. Uh, I tried to push my blade out so you can see there's a definitive difference between the left side and the right. And this is kind of what you would see with, to varying degrees on people with six scapula. However, it's kind of hard to uh, say that one is normal or borderline normal and one is not, especially since a lot of these people are um, preventatively wanting to take care of this stuff. Um, a rotator cuff tear, on the other hand, is a very clear thing to see, and I think everyone can see as my cursor comes in. This is a retracted stump of the supraspinatus, and this was a real patient that we had. Um, this is something that needs to be fixed. Um, and actually, uh, on another note, there was another person that we had that uh, they were going to therapy for about four months, and uh, we confirmed on an ultrasound, a diagnostic ultrasound, that they had uh, they had a pretty big tear in the, in the supraspinatus, and they had not had an image before. And I told them that uh, my analogy, and you'll see that I, I love analogies, is that imagine I'm standing here with a piece of drywall and I'm just kicking it, kicking it real hard, and eventually a hole pops in it, and you have this hole. So the answer is really you got to fix the hole and tell them to stop kicking. You can't do one or the other, or else the whole thing's not going to be fixed. So in regards to um, her therapies, they were mainly revolving around six scapula, which is this. And I would say this is telling me to stop kick. However, this, there's a hole in it. It has to be addressed. So, depending on the size of the hole, sometimes you can um, do different uh, things on it. But for the most part, if it's large enough, you have to, t you have to put it back on. Now, this person that we have uh, is actually, this was an MRI and an ultrasound of the same person. I'll bring my cursor in, you'll see that this is the, a lot of people, people can't read musculoskeletal ultrasounds, which is a disappointment actually. Uh, I strongly suggest it done on a lot of people because you can see very clearly the differences, regardless if we're looking at MRI or not, you can see there's something wrong with the shoulder if you knew what normal was. So here is the humeral head, 
and this is all black shadow. Here's the deltoid, and here's the supraspinatus that should be coming this way and attaching just like that. You notice that it's gone, and it's actually retracted back here, just as with this picture, it's retracted back here. So you can see holes and things of that nature in uh, musculoskeletal ultrasounds, which are usually much faster to get, much cheaper to get, um, and you can actually image a lot of the things and do a bilateral comparison to see what's normal and abnormal with these patients. So it's something that's going to become uh, mainstream very quickly if, uh, it ha if it hasn't already by the time you've seen this video. So prevention of rotator cuff conditions, you need to start mainly with stopping the kicking. So does the shoulder blade do what it's supposed to do? Uh, does it move how it's intended? And does it allow the cuff to do the job that it's supposed to? The main job of the rotator cuff is to keep the humeral head uh, in, or, or in, inside the glenohumeral fossa, they call it, or in the, um, the ball in the socket. If it's not properly in there, it's going to tear everything else up, kind of how we showed on that, uh, on that low rider type of example. So you have to make sure that everything works well. Cartilage tears are a whole different animal, and this would be a very classic thing uh, seen with dislocated shoulders, trauma, um, a lot, sometimes overuse. Baseball pitchers will get things like slap tears, and it's usually where the biceps tendon here pulls on some of the cartilage, which actually you can't see here. The reason why I picked this picture, even though you can't see the cartilage, is because it's not copyrighted again, but you can see the capsule or the fascia here is deeper than the muscles, and you don't see any muscles actually in this picture at all. So there's no muscles. What are you going to stretch out with a cartilage tear? Probably nothing, all right? It's something that if you're doing mobility-based warm-ups for it, you're not going to get any results from it, and you're just going to go undiagnosed and shred up your uh, cartilage for a very long time. So just make sure that you are looking at proper imaging, getting the t proper testing done, and so on to make sure you have what you think you don't, or think what you have, or have what you, know what you have, put it that way. So, after we presented this to some of the gyms, people had questions about what they had, and we said, you know what, I would love to uh, stop and talk to you all about what you have, but at the same time, we can't do this all right now, we need proper uh, history, we need to make sure to do tests and so on. History does tell a lot of stuff, but at the same time, we have to make sure that we're not brushing things off and doing things improperly to give them an answer right there on the spot. So, the best call of action usually to find out what you have is going to be to schedule an exam with somebody, they'll do, they'll do standard orthopedics tests and put the history together and figure out one or two things that you probably have. Let's say it's a rotator cuff or a labral tear. We don't know yet. They might want to recommend for a musculoskeletal ultrasound or an MRI based upon whatever you want to do or whatever they think is more probable to be there. So if we find this and it looks like you had a rotator cuff tear anyways on the history and exam, then it looks like your rotator cuff is the, is the cause of your pain. So there's a lot of things that we have to add up as healthcare providers to be able to give you the answer of proper remedies of how you fix these things and how you would warm it up. So now here's our contact info. Um, if you go onto our website, p2sportscare.com, you'll see one of the buttons that um, allows us to talk to you. Um, there are some guidelines that we have to follow in California and in the U.S. in general. Uh, we can't just give medical advice over the phone, um, but for the most part, um, we have to stay within our, uh, our state. So we're in California. We can talk to people in California. However, um, Keep in mind that we are not doing a medical exam on the phone, over the phone. We cannot give special or very direct um, advice. We're mainly just informing what we would do if this was us. Um, again, we're talking about theory. So for the most part, I feel like if people called and they learned more about the body in general and theory about how, let's say, shoulders worked, they would be able to, to deduct certain people they should talk to in certain um, questions they can ask these people when they actually get in front of them in person uh, about what they should be doing for their specific shoulder condition. So again, we'd love to help you out and, and guide you guys to the right people um, who can help you directly one-on-one -on -one to make sure you get the right medical exam, you get the right advice, and you're doing the right thing for your shoulder. Thanks guys, take care.